participation in the gospel. When people put their hands to the plow, you can change the world. However, we have a tendency as Christians sometimes to be a part of Christianity but not be a part of participating in Christianity. I, I, I told you about how when I was younger, I was a part of a basketball team, but because I was afraid of the basketball, I'd suit up like a basketball player. I'd look like a basketball player. I was on the court, but I wasn't in the game. Because if they happened to throw me the ball, I wouldn't know what to do with it. So I would stay as far away from the ball as I could, but I looked good. In fact, you know what? I found some pictures of when I was a basketball player. There you go. Does that look good or what? And look at the air this guy catches when he poses for a shot. That wasn't in the game. That was posing. And, and uh, look at that. I even got a trophy that year. Huh? What do you think? Yeah, actually, everybody got a trophy that year, but that's beside the point. We can do the very same thing where we're, we're in... We're Christians, we look like, we smell like, but we don't participate in the gospel, taking it to our families. I mean, we're here on the weekends, but then we default back to the way we've always been. So we don't live what we believe. So we're on the court, but we're not in the game. And Paul the Apostle says, you know why I am so thrilled and there's such joy that wells up in my heart? Because of your participation in the gospel. Because that doesn't always happen. Some, uh, just the other week, my wife said, now, my daughter Abby is pregnant, very pregnant, with uh, her third child. And, uh, and Anna called me and said, Abby and I uh, went bowling. I said, no, Mom, she is pregnant. Oh, no, no, she has a Wii, a Nintendo Wii, and they have this remote thing, and you do this in the living room. I said, you're not bowling? You're, it's a myth. You think you're bowling. Oh, no, she said, after that, we played tennis. <laughs> I said, you're a legend in your own mind. You're not playing tennis. And after we giggled for a while, I thought, you know, interesting. I wonder if there's a lot of us Christians that are playing we Christianity. We can do it in the living room, do it in church. And we think, whoo, we played tennis. No, you didn't. The reality is different from the imaginary. And Paul the Apostle says, you know what gives me the greatest joy is that you're not under a myth. And so he debunks three myths as we begin Philippians that we have to get rid of. And especially, boy, not only did he debunk those myths back then, he's debunking them today because we're almost in the same society that wants us to live with the myth. And if you're not careful, you'll not be a people of truth. We've got to be a people of truth. And though it's not always fashionable, freedom will only come to our families if we are bearers of the truth because you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And God put us on this earth to set people free. And if we, in the middle of a changing morality, like the same sex thing, if we just say, oh, they're fine, they will never be set free. No, we don't condemn them. God did not send us to condemn the world. But if we just figure that they're normal, it's fine, everything's cool, our hearts will not be inflamed for them, to pray for them, ask God on their behalf to set them free. We'll just say, yeah, they're good. And I want you to see the insidious nature of the enemy. Satan does not love homosexuals. He hates them. But he's going to get them to figure out a way that they become normal so we, the people of truth, don't spend any time with them because just normal. And then he takes them down lock, stock, and barrel. Don't think the enemy loves them. He hates them as much as anybody else. But he's going to do a double thing on them to say, Christians are against you. Let's pass some legislation. Everything is fine. And now I nail them all. Next, he will double cross you because he's the accuser and the father of lies we must be a people of truth and see things the way God sees them not to condemn them but never stop praying for them loving them and trying to find ways to reach them so that they can navigate their way out of darkness and into freedom 
Not a freedom to do whatever you want to, but a freedom to not have to be a part of that anymore. I'm free to serve Christ the way he created me to serve him. So we want to be a people of truth. And, and Paul's going to debunk some myths, not only back then, but here today as well. Because if you live by myths, you'll miss the truth. And here's some of the myths. Number one is, and you'll see them in your notes, if you believe in Jesus, and I'll just give them to you off the top. If you believe in Jesus and can quote the Bible, good, you're good, you're going to go to heaven. Just believe in God, good, you're, in, you're good. And if that's good enough, then we become sedated for the rest of our lives. Here's another myth. It's the Christian's duty or the church's duty to point out the sins of the world. And we think, now, if I can point out how sinful you are and how wrong you are, it makes me feel holier. That's selfishness. It's called religious or, or a, a self-righteousness. And the third one, ah, God will be with you whatever you do because he loves you. Well, it's truth and error. So we're going to take a look at each one of these. And number one, let's take a look at this. If you believe in Jesus, can quote the Bible, that's good. You're going to go to heaven. Well, let's read what Philippians 15 through 17 says in your notes. Let's read it out loud. Go. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife out of selfish and... Hold on right there. Wait a minute. Some are preaching Christ saying the right things. Wrong heart. Yeah. He says, you see... Just because you believe in Christ, you've you got to have a right heart. Otherwise, you can say the right things, but your hearts will be far from God. And that's what the Pharisees were made out of. Let's continue. Out of selfish ambition, continue, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. You see, one of the myths that we have as Christians is if you say all the right things and have the right words, you're good. Believe in God. I believe in God. I believe the Bible. I can even quote one, John 3, 16, for God's love the world, he's in a little bit against and just go crazy on that. And we're good. If you say the right things, but your hearts are wrong, God is saying, whoa, whoa, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Saying the right things. I... I have a heaven story for you. Are you ready? All right, here is a guy. He, was, he had the right words, but his heart was real and poor, impure. So he dies and goes to heaven. He's at the pearly gates, and he goes, Hey, I like getting heavy. Peter says, Well, you know, the Bible says certain requirements. Yeah, the Bible says you, if you're generous, you can go to heaven. Well, he says, Yeah, in part, he says, that. Well, I'm generous. Says, really? Yeah, I'm generous. I should go to heaven. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. When were you generous? Last year. I gave a quarter to a homeless man. Gabriel's standing next to Peter. He says, Gabriel, check the record. Yeah, he gave a quarter on Bishop Street to a homeless man at the bus stop. Oh, but his attitude's bad. I know, I know, I know. But he's saying the right things. What are we going to do? Uh, now, do you have any more proof that you're generous? Yeah! Last year, I gave 75 cents to a kid at the state fair. Really? Gabriel, what does that look like? Uh, yeah, he did. He gave 75 cents to a kid at the state fair. But his attitude's bad. His heart's so far. He's, yeah, but he's saying the right things. What do we do? Peter said, leave it to me. He said, so you gave a quarter over here and 75 cents equals a dollar, right? Yeah. Gabriel, give him back his dollar and push him out. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have all the right words, but the heart is wrong. And that... That causes us to not participate in the gospel because we'll say the right things. I think we'll be surprised who we'll see in heaven. I think the ones that have all the right words but their hearts are wrong aren't the people that God is going to use. That's why it's so important to be a people of truth in our hearts. I have another heaven story. Want to hear it? All right, all right. Doesn't matter because I won't tell it anyway. Uh, 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 Einstein comes before... Peter and Einstein says, I'm Albert Einstein. Peter says, you know, there's been some imposters here. I don't know. I mean, you look like Einstein, but you could be an imposter. Can you prove that this is who you are? Oh, bring me a chalkboard. He puts down the equation for the theory of relativity. Fills his whole board with this amazing equation. 
Peter goes, whoa, you are Albert Einstein. Come on in. The next one comes up. Who are you? I'm Picasso. Picasso. I mean to tell you, there's people imposters. They're, they're, they're imposing themselves. And they're, and you're faking it all over the place. Can you prove that you're Picasso? He said, sure, bring me a canvas and a brush. Beautiful masterpiece. Oh, Peter says, this is beautiful. Come on in, Picasso. The third guy comes up. Who are you? I'm a Portuguese pasta. <laughs> Peter said, oh, are, you, are, are you another imposter here? He said, no, I'm a Portuguese pasta. You should let me in. Peter said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Can you prove that you're a pastor? Well, I don't know. Well, you know, Albert Einstein came and he proved it. Picasso came and he proved it. You have to prove it. Portuguese pastor says, Einstein, who's Einstein? Picasso, who's Picasso? St. Peter said, good, you can come in. <laughs> we'll be surprised who we're going to see in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. There's a myth that says, oh, if you just believe in God, it's good enough. And it's going out in the world today where people just accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and that's it. And they're not participating in the gospel. Their lives go crazy. Their marriages go down. Their relationships go bad. But they're Christians, are they? Well, we've got so much more to go. And Paul says, he who has begun a good work in you, let him finish it until the day of Christ. Don't get caught up in a myth because then you'll lose the truth and you'll just float and you'll never participate in the gospel. Yeah, but I believe in God. Isn't that enough? That's what the Bible says. Well, I say to them, yeah, yeah that's, that's a start, but you're right just now right at the level of the devil himself. Well, what do you mean? See, there's no demons in the universe that's atheist. They all know God, and they all believe in God. But the book of James says it this way. Let's read it on, on, in your notes or on the board. Go. You believe that God is one God. Good. Even the believe and yeah even the demons believe that but what paul is saying is i want you to move beyond that and participate in the gospel that's the difference because demons believe we believe but what they don't do and what sets us apart is we participate in the gospel remember last week when uh, we had some pastors come together 150 of them and we said we have to participate if we know the truth and we had a same-sex bill about ready to be pushed into the special session, we said, we've got to call our senators and reps. And just several thousand people called their reps and, and senators, and Wednesday, they stopped it. They said, no, can't do it. And it was wonderful. Why? How did we change stuff? Because we knew about it? No, because we what? Participated in it. And all it takes is know what district you're in, who is your rep, call that one person and say no. Because you see, they are representing us. But we got to tell them what to represent if they're representing us. And if we don't say anything, they figure we're good with it. The redeemed of the Lord have to participate in the gospel or the gospel will not prevail and people will never be free. We can know it. We can think about it. We can have the right words. But until we participate and get in the game, not just on the court, we won't change the world. But you notice when we did that, everything changed. You see that? It's a participation in the gospel. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, Wayne. Didn't in 1998 we voted a constitutional amendment that it was to be marriage was between a man and a woman? Mm -hmm, we did. But if you recall, those of you who voted back then, the wording was changed. And it says this, the legislature shall reserve the right to define marriage as between a man and a woman. We said yes. But do you remember what you voted on? The legislature shall reserve the right to define marriage as between a man and a woman. Well, if we give them that okay, they also have implicitly given to them as permission the right to undefine marriage or not define marriage as between a man and a woman. So although we voted back then, right now the legislature is deciding whether or not they're going to define it as such. So a special session comes up 
and they're going to vote on it. We should have said no to that wording back then, but we didn't. So what you voted on wasn't the definition of marriage. It was to give the legislature the right to define the definition of marriage. So now it's come up and it's festering and they have to make that definition. So we've got to call our reps and say, the definition is just this. It's between man and woman. So some people say, well, just stop that bill. You can't. It's already been submitted. So how do you stop it? You vote it down. So you can't say just get rid of the bill. No, we have to vote it down. That's in a pluralistic democratic society. And since we gave the legislature that power, they're going to vote on it. So what do we have to do? you got to tell those who represent you that you would like it voted down. If you don't, they figure you're good with it. What do we need to do? Participate in the truth participate and when you do we can change the world so this next week I want to encourage you please do call your senator call your representative because even though they stopped the special session they didn't stop it they delayed it to give more input and so please call them because it will come up participation in the gospel Let's take a look at the second myth, and I'm going to give you some truths about what's going on right now. The second myth is it's the churches or the Christians' duty to point out the sins of the world. It's not. Although people think that, it's not. Let's read the scripture. Go. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Here it is. Among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may have cause to glory, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Our goal is not to condemn those. It's to seek and save the lost. But if legislature comes up and says, no, they're not immoral, it is normal, and if we accept that, then we lose a heart for them. And remember, Satan doesn't love them, he hates them. But he's going to make it think that we're against them, so they push further away, and then he nails them down wholesale. Satan never loved anybody except himself. He is the accuser of the brethren and he is the father of all lies. And so there's going to be a lack of truth that will deceive them to fight against the very people that would be their hope of freedom. But first, we must be a people of truth. Now, the danger of legislation is this. The legislation can give people or force people to do one thing or another and conform to the laws, but it also at the same time has a tendency to steal virtue out of people and make us even more secular so that we depend only on civil law but not what's within. Do you remember um, Gulliver's travel, travels when the big giant gets up in, in that Lilliputian uh, area and he finds that all these little ropes are tying him down by these thousands of Lilliputians or Putians or people, Lily people. And so he's tied down while he can't get up. Well, in, in like manner, when you're young, you have external uh, regulations about what you do, what you should say. Say thank you, say thank you, uncle, say sorry. So that's legislated to you. As you grow up, Parents don't say those as much. You mature if you take those external supervision, external commands, and put those on the inside. Take them off on the outside, put them on in the inside, so that you build virtue. Virtue. The law regulates lesser people. Virtue regulates greater people. It's those who understand that the discipline my parents gave me that said, if you don't, you get a spanking. As I grow up, I don't, not because of the spanking, 
because I know it's right. I've taken that external rope and put it on the inside, and that's called virtue. Now, here's a danger of legislation, how it can steal virtue because it's saying, we will tell you what to do on the outside again. It's sort of like this. Let's say John Tilton, our administrator, and I are walking down a pathway. And because, by the way, anything that the government has a part of or legislates, and nothing wrong with that, but they have to watch out and steward it well, because anything of legislation carries with it, a part of it is compulsion or compulsory. And here's how one author says it. Let's say John and I are walking down a pathway, and I'm hungry, I'm famished. And I look at him, he's got a sandwich. Oh, John, I want your sandwich because I'm hungry. John looks at his, at his sandwich and says, well, I'm hungry too, but not as hungry as he is, and I'd like to keep it, uh, but uh, okay, I I'll give it to him. He says, here, here's my sandwich. Oh, thank you. A transaction was made. I feel grateful. He feels good and virtuous for having given me the sandwich, right? All right. Sandwich given. I'm happy. We're closer friends. I'm grateful. There's virtue to this transaction. Everybody got that? Okay. Now, rewind the tape. John, I want your sandwich. I'm hungry. Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of hungry too, but not as hungry as he. All of a sudden, he, here comes a sheriff, takes out his pistol. He said, I'm from the county of Hawaii and Oahu and you, and he puts a gun to John's head. You give that man your sandwich. Well, John goes, whoa, here's my sandwich. Now, transaction is exactly the same as the first scenario. Ultimately, the, still the sandwich has been transferred. Got it? But you see, when it's under compulsion, virtue, the virtue of that transaction is stolen. And it doesn't make me grateful. It doesn't make him feel good that it's been a virtuous thing of generosity. It actually makes this guy feel slighted and disenfranchised because of this. And it makes me feel entitled it's like, thank you. And by the way, he's got some money in his wallet that he doesn't really need. Give him the money. Yeah, because we should even out the economic strata. I mean, kind of distribute wealth. Give him your money, at least half of that. Okay, here, we share. Now we're equal. And now what it's done is it's caused me to develop entitlement and I become narcissistic. Like, I deserve this. It makes this guy antagonistic towards me. When in the first place, it could have brought virtue. Whenever you have legislation, it steals virtue. So legislation has to be utilized very carefully and cautiously because it's a double-edged sword. It causes the exchange to take place, but it steals virtue from people. And so as we go through this legislation, we're saying be careful because we'd like to understand this and have a say in this. So when we said please stay this thing so we can have a say, if it's rushed back in, it steals virtue. And then, then there's going to be antagonism between the two. Another thing that you have to understand, not only legislation, but about freedom, the First Amendment. The First Amendment gives you a freedom of speech. And you have that, and that's good. Now watch this. When it gives you the freedom to say something, it also protects this other person for not having to say something. It's the freedom to speak and the freedom not to speak. The freedom to advocate something and the freedom to not have to advocate that. So it's a double-edged sword. You understand that? So if a Christian says, I don't want to advocate that, they cannot say that's discriminatory. No, the very reason the First Amendment was given was to protect Christians to not have to be forced to advocate something they don't want to advocate. But last week, the Supreme Court in New Mexico fined Elaine Photography for not 
taking pictures of a lesbian ceremony. That, they said, was discriminatory. She had to pay $6,600 in penalty because she wanted to exercise her First Amendment rights to say, I don't advocate that. Sorry, because that's not my religious belief. That's discrimination. Remember, freedom of speech gives this person the freedom to say, but it also gives you the freedom to not have to advocate what he says and say something different. It has to protect both. But instead, the courts came in and said, that's the same as not serving a black person at a restaurant. Like, whoa, wait a minute. Let me give you some more truth on that. Because although I know it's fashionable to compare people who discriminate against homosexuals as if it were racial, it seems very fashionable, but it's a fallacy. You can't do that, and I'll explain in a second. G.K. Chesterton said, a fallacy is a fallacy even though it becomes fashionable, it is still a fallacy. Now, it's fashionable to use that and blend it together, but it's wrong, 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 and that judge to have compared that was wrong, 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 wrong. You see, there's a big difference between race and sexual choice. Race, you're born into that, right? That's in your genes. And to try and say we were born with these genes is a fallacy because of all of the tests, experiment and research and science, we have not yet found one gay gene. There are no gay genes. So homosexuality is a behavioral choice that we have made somehow along the way. Now you say, well, what about the tendency to have same-sex attraction? Oh yeah, there's tendencies like that. But because there's a tendency, does not mean that we must force the people to advocate the action of carrying out that tendency. So we are not forced to advocate that as normal. Now listen carefully. If it were racial or it's bo I'm born into that, then this couldn't happen where there are former homosexuals. But nevertheless, there are. Did you know that in, our, that in our church, we have many former homosexuals and former lesbians, lesbians who have a fabulous life now in Christ and they have been set free by the power of God. How many of you are thankful that there are former of those here living for Christ? Yep. Former alcoholics that God has set free. So many. Now, if homosexuality were a gene, you would never have former homosexuals because they're changed. Uh, otherwise, you'd, 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 you'd hear people say, and it's crazy, but you'd hear people say, you know, I used to be Japanese, but now I'm Haole. <laughs> I used to be Afro-American, but now I'm Portuguese. Well, that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. I used to be holy, now I'm Asian. It doesn't happen because if you're born into a race, you can't change that. That's who you are, right? And so you must give equality to that because it's not their thing. It's God's thing. However, we have many people who have come out of alternative lifestyles that are living a wonderful life free of that because of the power of Christ. So is it genetic? No, it's a behavioral choice and it may have been a tendency, but just because you have a tendency to something, it doesn't mean you have to follow through with that. There's no gay gene. Uh, you know, it was, otherwise this girl that didn't want to photograph that wedding, she could have said, you know, I would have judged, but you know, I got an anti-gay gene in me. Sorry, that's just how I am, right? Because if you say one for one, you got to do it for the other. And we don't have anti-gay genes. You don't have those things. You don't have an alcoholic gene in you. So like, that's, that's just how I am. You have to advocate alcoholism because it's in my genes. No, I, I know that in a lot of women, there's a chocolate gene. But other than that, I don't know of any others. So you, although it's fashionable to compare it with racism, it's not truth, it's fallacy.
Do you understand? So if we can get the public to buy into that fallacy, it's like we can't be a people of truth anymore. But if until we understand and know the truth, we'll go off and we'll condemn because that's easier. But in these days, you have to think and you have to know the truth because only by knowing the truth will you be set free. But remember, it's not to condemn them. If they make that through legislation normal, one, Christians will figure they're fine, we'll leave it alone. They need our love, our prayer, the mercy of God, and a way to be free, not to be ignored. That's what the enemy wants. You see how insidious he is? Leave them alone, ignore them, so that I can take them down wholesale. He doesn't love anybody. And we have to understand that there's going to be fashionable rationalities, but they're fallacies. If you know the truth, you'll understand how to bring freedom. So make sure that you don't fall prey to the myth that it's a Christian's duty to point out sins. Now, you can't ignore sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 34, would you read it with me? Go. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any. Yeah. Jesus always works by changing the heart, not by legislating. Because legislation can force compliance, but it never produces the virtue necessary to exalt a nation. Let me say that again. Jesus works by changing the heart. That's the church. Through the church. Not by legislating. Because legislation can only force compliance, but it can never produce the virtue necessary to change a nation or exalt a nation. And then the third myth that he works with is this. God will be with us whatever we do. Well, we live in a nation that wants God to loosen up on his morals because God's going to be with us anyway. True? Not really. In fact, let's read the scripture. Verse 9, go. The things which you have learned and received and heard in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You can ensure the presence of God when you practice these things. However, we want God to loosen up on his laws. Here's a tip. You don't want God to loosen up on his laws. No, especially when you read this next scripture. Read it with me. Go. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Listen, he said to the moon, I want you to be 238,000 miles away from the earth. Son, I want you to burn at 488 million degrees Fahrenheit. And I want you to be this far, Earth. I want you to be on 23 degree axis, flipping around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour. Light, travel at 186,000 miles per second. Sound, 768 miles an hour. And I want everybody to go exactly like I want you to go. Now, stay and rotate in precision. Go. Nobody change. Because you see, God knew that if the earth were any closer to the sun and wobbled out of that orbit, we would fry to death in one day. If the moon came any closer than 238,000 miles to the earth, we would be inundated with tidal waves because it would affect the gravitational pull of all the tides. God said, you stay exactly like that. Don't overswing the pendulum. Don't come any closer. Stay exactly where you are in the middle. And now we have what we have. If God loosened up his laws, there would be a cataclysmic collision and man would be annihilated in minutes. And yet we as men say, loosen up your laws around here. Watch this. Here's what God says. You don't want me to loosen my laws. You want to pray that you move in rhythm with my laws. Because when you move in rhythm with my laws, the result is the blessings of God. That's how I created it. If you want to work in dissonance with God and go out of rhythm, that's called disobedience, then the consequences of the wages of sin is death. death. Remember, when we move out of rhythm with God and do what we want to do with upraised fists because we think we want to be free, 
And God is saying, no, freedom isn't defined as what you can do now in dissonance with me. Freedom is all those things you don't have to do anymore that's pulling you away from me so that you can be free to move in rhythm with God. And the result will be blessing. You see, you're not necessarily punished for your sin. You're punished by your sin. Did you catch that? Because when I sin against God, I move out of his atmosphere of blessing. And then I say, what's all of this dissonance? Why all the collisions and relationships and marriage and life? Well, it wasn't God that's doing it. It is my sin. So God says, no, no, come back in rhythm with me. That's called obedience. And when you work with my laws, not against my laws, the blessings come for righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So what do we want to do as a church to come back into rhythm with God and call people to do the same? Not to demean them, but to show them the way to God's design and freedom. And we have to learn to do that with grace. But neither can we ignore sin and just loosen up on God's morals and think that's the way to our future. It will destroy people's lives. So do we want God to loosen up? No, keep it just like you are, God. But help us to move in rhythm with your design that results in the blessings and the favor of God. And help us to show people that when they, with upraised fist, choose to be dissonant with God and think it's freedom, it is only bondage. Teach us to be a people of the truth, to be able to articulate it in a way that leads people out of bondage and into grace. Let me finish with this line. That's why I write there at the end of your notes, the cost of obedience is nothing compared to the cost of disobedience. Some of you, as we close, I want to pray for you. Some of you are struggling with moral things and wondering, where do I fit? Always remember that if you're struggling with homosexuality, alcoholism, fornication, pornography, all of us have our own battles. This is your home church. You're not going to be condemned for it because we all got our own battles. But together, we must acknowledge the truth of God and move to rhythm with God rather than push further away from God and say, give me permission because that's where I'm comfortable. No, that's where you die. So we love you enough to say, no, we have to acknowledge that that's sin, but acknowledge God's truth. And now you become the people God created you to be and you are now free from the pull of death because of the power of God that sets you free. But it requires you to know the truth, not deny the truth, not get mad at the truth, not look for legislation that will keep me insulated from the truth, which will steal virtue from America. Instead, we say, God, teach us what your rhythm is. Help us to cooperate with you. And the result of your favor comes back to our nation. Then you can say, God bless America. And he says, I will, because you're moving in rhythm with my laws. Oh, sounds so good. If you're struggling with homosexuality and you hear me talk about these things, never think, well, Wayne must hate us. No, I'm not homophobic at all. I'm your best friend, really, because I will not deny the danger of that, along with fornication, pornography. There's danger. Yeah, but you're on a crusade. Oh, you know, it's sort of like if I were an emergency room technician, like an ER doctor, and I see women battered coming in every day, being battered and beaten because of domestic abuse. After a while, I, as an ER physician, I'm mad at domestic abuse. I'm going to do classes on domestic abuse. I'm going to work with those caught in that and say, don't do that. Why? Because I see the devastating effect on these women. I work in the ER. I'm tired of that. Well, if I say, well, you know, I really don't care about it. I just want to just do my job in a dispassionate way. No, I, I love these people. So even though I, I am upset at domestic abuse, it doesn't define that I don't like these people. 
but yet it will be found sometimes people are struggling with homosexuality and hear me talk about same sex and they go oh man he doesn't love us oh no i love you more than you'll ever know because if i just ignored you you will be stolen by the enemy wholesale but i see the devastating effects of this all the time and i'm going to say let's stop domestic abuse because i love these people never define it as I'm saying this because I hate them or I'm homophobic or whatever. Oh, no. And that's why Jesus came to teach us his word and say sin is going to destroy you because he hates sinners. No, because he loves sinners and he knows you're not necessarily punished for sin, but by sin. So he came to give his life so that we might be free because you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if you're here, part of our family, and you're struggling with whatever, know your love, your embrace, you're not condemned. We want God's best for you. And that's the kind of family that we want to call New Hope, our home church. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's stand together. Would you bow your heads and we're going to pray. Father, thank you for every man and woman and child here in this church. And we're all going through our own personal battles, but thank you for loving us through them, not denying that we have them, and not us demanding that you never deal with any of that so we feel better, not ignoring that as sin so that we can continue in it only to find a dead end. But instead, Lord, our love for you is going to be expressed in our love for every person, whether they're struggling with same sex or alcohol or pornography or immorality, adultery, anger, greed, avarice. Lord, we're all struggling with different things, but we're going to make it together. We're going to learn together because we're committed to the truth, not to our perception of the truth, but the biblical definition of truth. And once we catch that, we can explain stuff a little bit better. We can articulate a little better. So, Father, I pray that you'll help us to be a people of the truth. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your patience. We need your grace. We ask your blessing on this fabulous family because we are indeed a people of new hope in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray and we say... Thank God with a clap offering, would you?